What profit is there in prophecy? What can we benefit from prophecy? And so someone says, well, why should we even study prophecy? Well, we're going to look at uh, all of that this morning and try to learn something as why prophecy is important, why we should study it, uh, why we should dig into it. And so we're going to get a good overall view of that this morning from the Scripture concerning the, the prophet, the beneficiary, and the benefit of Bible prophecy. So let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 3, if you would with me. Blessed is he... What's the first thing? What's the first thing you notice? What was the first word? First word, it says blessed. So that's going to give you a key right there, okay? Blessed is he that what? Readeth, and they that hear or keep or heed the words of this prophecy, and keep or heed those things which are written therein. And why is that? For the time is at hand. So it's important why we study Bible prophecy. Well, number one, you can see there, you're blessed if you do. How many of you want a special blessing? There is a special blessing for those who study and read and keep or take heed to Bible prophecy. And the reason for that is 25% of your Bible is Bible prophecy. 25%. And so that's why we're going to take a look at it, because this morning's service is going to be really good, and this morning as well. Father, bless our time in your study now. We ask for your illumination, understanding of the Scriptures. We ask that we would have ears to hear, hearts and emotions to feel. And we ask that as we gain understanding and knowledge, that we would apply it, that we would have the wisdom to apply it. Now, Lord, as you uh, address the churches here in the beginning... And the Spirit of God says, To him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And Jesus in the New Testament made it clear that we are to hear the words of Jesus if we have ears. So God give us ears to hear today, minds to reason and to think, and wisdom to apply it. And we'll thank you for it in the wonderful name of Jesus. And before we say amen, Lord, again, we ask for your divine help and wisdom and to bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us. And again, we ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide, and we certainly ask for His anointing upon the Word this morning and upon your servant. And Father, we'll thank you for it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, let's read it again together while everybody's now in and seated. Verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed is he that readeth, there's your first thing, and they that hear, so you got to hear, what are you to hear? The words of this prophecy. Even the Word of God tells us that this book is prophecy. And then keep or heed those things which are written therein. And John under the Holy Spirit tells us why, because for the time is at hand. So there's a special blessing to those especially who read the book of Revelation who study the book of Revelation, who heed and keep uh, the things in the book of Revelation, God promises us a a, a special blessing. Now, the book of Revelation is one book that has a special blessing pronounced upon those who read it and heed it. And the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. And how do we know that? Because verse 3 just told us. How many of you believe the Word of God is inspired? Okay, all Scripture is given by inspiration. And so the Bible tells us. 25% of the Bible is given to prophecy. Now, church, if 25% of the Bible is prophecy, then did the Holy Spirit make a mistake when we have the prophecy of God's Word? Of course not. There's an incredible, wonderful blessing in the study of prophecy. And so that's why we're looking at uh, this time that we're going through. And in our series this morning is really going to be good. You learned a lot. I think a lot of people said last week when they left, they learned a lot of things and opened their eyes up to new stuff. And I hope that, and I think this morning is going to be the same thing as we get into it. So you're going to enjoy it. And I'm asking you to be praying for me that God will certainly bring to remembrance all the things that we have studied this week. Because, man, there's a ton of it going on in my head. And to try to bring it out, make it as clear and 
and possible. And, and then sometimes if I'm going too fast, you might need to wave, wave up a flag and wave it. That's a surrender flag, slow down, or a yellow flag, caution, you know. So, but we got a lot, but it's going to be fun. So what profit is prophecy? How to profit from prophecy? Well, because the verse tells us that we can do that very thing, that we can, pro- we can profit from prophecy. So, what can you and I do with prophecy? Since we're to study it, we're to obey it, we're to apply it, what can we do with it since there's a special blessing? Well, first of all, I want you to know, you can turn prophecy into praise. You can turn prophecy into praise. All right, so let's take a look at it, because for number one, the reason why, the Bible gives us the mystery of history. Prophecy will give us the mystery of history. What's mystery? Divine truth that's been hidden, and so that's why we study it. Look at Revelation eleven fifteen with me. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voices in heaven saying. Now, look what it's saying here. Everybody ready? Here we go. This is yet history, future, yet to come. This is how we can turn prophecy into praise. For the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. What can prophecy do for you? That verse can turn your prophecy into praise. You're hearing about all the kingdoms today and what's going on and what's happening, and how they're lining up. And the Scripture tells us that kingdom's going to rise against nation against nation. That's ethnic group, people groups, kingdom against kingdom. And that can get us to worry and get us to what's going on and what's happening and so forth. And yet prophecy tells me that one of these days all the kingdoms of the earth are going to be His, and He's going to reign forever. That's worth praising. See, you can, turn your, you can turn what's going on right now into praise because prophecy, the mystery of the history of prophecy, can turn it into praise. Let's look at another one that prophecy can do for us. This helps us to understand the mystery of history, prophecy does. What is? That God is moving history towards an end. How many believe that? Where what? Where kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. That's what history is telling us. And we have the future prophecy of that. And as a result of that, I don't have to worry about what China's doing, or what Korea's Korea's doing, or what Iran's doing, you know, and and, and what's Russia doing. And we know that the Bible prophecy tells us all these things are going to happen. And there's going to be that uprising, and there's going to be those battles. But future prophecy history tells me that, hey, It's eventually going to be all His, and He's going to rule and reign over it. So as a believer, I can praise God. Even in dark times and troubled times, we can turn our prophecy into praise. See, somebody says, well, we know all that's going to happen because the Bible tells us and we believe it. But, oh, it's scary. No, no, it's a time to praise God because our Lord's going to be the King of all the kingdoms. And we're going to be ruling and reigning with Him. That's worth praising God for. I mean, even if they send a nuclear rocket over here today and lands on the building, so what? We're instantly vaporized, and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, they can vaporize this body, but you can't vaporize my spirit and soul. That's to be with the Lord immediately. So you don't have to worry about it. So before the thing hits, God already knows that. Choo, takes our spirit and soul, and boom, it's simultaneously at the same time. And, uh, and you're going to see that this morning. Oh, no, 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 this is going to be good this morning. Don't wait. So what do I do? I can turn the mystery of the history into praise. What else can I turn into praise? I believe the mystery of suffering. Anybody suffering here today? Anybody suffered before? Sure we have. We all have. Talking with people this week, even in our church, that are going through some tough times and difficult times and are suffering. Well, guess what? What prophets there in prophecy? You can turn your prophecy of suffering into praise. Look what the scripture says here. When you study prophecy, you can make sense out of suffering. When you study prophecy, it helps you to make sense out of your suffering that you're going through. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Everybody with me? Romans 8, 22 through 23. For I reckon, that's a time of an accounting that we have, that the sufferings of this present time, what? 
the suffer. How many are suffering this morning? How many have been suffering? How many are going to go for some suffering? Well, hang in there, you will. Nobody's going to escape this planet without it. It's just a matter of time and when. But hey, how at this present time are not worthy. Listen to me now. The suffering you and I are experiencing is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Why? For we know that the whole of creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Present tense. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Oh, we know there is more to come, folks. It's not over yet. So you see, you can turn your suffering into praise because you know that the glory is yet to come. And we're going to be glorified. We're going to live in His glory. And so we have that wonderful opportunity, church, that we can turn our suffering into praise. Are you with me? Okay. All right. Third, we're talking about turning our prophecy. What benefit is it? Well, it can turn into praise. Are you with me? Amen. All right, let's look. So what's the first thing we can turn into praise? History. The mystery of history. What's, because of prophecy. What's the second thing we can turn into praise? The mystery of our suffering. That we can't compare it to the glory that's coming. Some of you have got aches and pains you've had for many, many, many years. Maybe even experienced all your life. But that's going to turn into glory. There's no comparison. Some of you in here got ringing in your ear and you've had it for 10 years. Amen. But isn't it great to know because of prophecy, prophecy tells me, sisters and brothers, that I can take my suffering and turn it into joy and glory, knowing that glory awaits us. Folks, there's not going to be any more pain and suffering when you go to glory. It's just not going to happen. And believe me, it could happen today. The imminent return of Jesus Christ could come today. And all this pain and suffering we're going through well, Paul says we can't even begin to compare it to the glory that awaits us. I was talking with someone this week, and I said, you know, because of all the stuff that's going on around us, and, uh, you know, the news, the good news, the fake news, the false news, the, the conservative news, everything. You know, just good writers, good journalists, that, you know, conservative journalists, and Christian brothers and sisters that are talking. And again, it just struck to me that, you know, we, we, we've got to get our focus off horizontally and you got to start focusing vertically. As believers, our focus is vertical, not horizontal. Get your eyes off the things and, and, and people and everyone and everything that's going on horizontally and start focusing vertically. The Scripture admonishes us, exhorts us, and even commands us that we are to be looking, longing, and loving for that glorious and great appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in order to do that, we've got to be listening for the shout, for the trumpet, and we've got to be focused looking up. Because he's going to split the eastern sky one of these days, folks. And that's what we need to be focused on. Quit focusing on everything else because you're getting your focus out of whack. And by the way, just mentioning on that thing, we're all running a race. Amen? We've got a race to run. And I, I guess we all want to run it well at least as a believer, I do. I have a race here that I, I'm running, and I want to run it well, and my heart's desire for my Lord is to finish it well. I don't care if I come in first. I just want to finish the race well. You know what I'm saying? And in order to do that, the apostle that wrote the book of Hebrews, whoever it was, tells me that I've got to lay aside every weight that's going to slow me down in the race. Every circumstance, every baggage, you've got to lay it aside that besets us and so easily slows us down in the race. And you see, and the only way you're going to do that is focus vertically. Focus upward. Because if you stay focused here, you're carrying all this weight and baggage, and you have, you're not going to run the race well. It's going to slow you down. So this is great. I love prophecy. All right, thirdly, the mystery of God's justice. The mystery of God's justice. What profit is there in prophecy? Well, I can learn the mystery of history, that Jesus is going to rule the kingdoms one day. That's worth praising God. I can learn the mystery of my suffering, that one day it's not going to be compared to the glory that we're going to have in glory and so forth. And I can praise God for that. So you've got to start learning to praise God for all your problems, for all your aches and pains, your ear ringing. You've got to praise God. 
You know, you just need to learn to praise God. Amen. Then there's the mystery of God's justice. Oh, how many of you are longing for God's justice? Uh, how many of us are just waiting and begging for God's justice to come upon the scene? Because today it doesn't look like any justice is happening, does it? No, not at all. And we wonder, and it seems like it's going out the window, and, and law enforcement's hands are tied, and they can't hardly do anything anymore uh, because of the government and the way everything is going. And, it's just, and we just wonder, is justice ever going to be served? Well, let's take a look at it. What else will prophecy do for you and I? The fact that you can rejoice in God's justice. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, Paul is telling us here that there are three kinds of judgment. There's man's judgment. That's when people judge us. Okay, and so in case you're wondering, go ahead, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. All right, everybody in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's take and read it. I didn't give you all the verses stuff. I wouldn't have room on the outline to put it there for you. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4. All right, everybody in 1 Corinthians 4. All right, let's, uh, Paul's here is, is leading uh, uh, about judging, uh, judgment here. Verse 3 says, but with me, it is a very small thing, Paul says, that I should be judged of you. Now, what's that telling you right there? If you feel like somebody's judging you, you need to take it. It's a very small thing. Okay, isn't that what he says? That's what Paul's telling us here. Okay, that's man's judging you. Second one, or man's judgment, yea, I judge not my own self. That's the second judgment he mentions, is self-judgment. That's when you and I judge ourselves. And isn't that what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when we come to the Lord's Supper? He tells us we're to judge ourselves, and if we judge ourselves, then God won't judge us. Okay, that's what he tells us. So there's self-judgment. That's where we judge ourselves. And then he says there's another judgment. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. So see, prophecy tells me that I can praise the Lord knowing that if you judge me, that's a small thing. I can judge myself, and what is that, really? But I can praise God knowing that one day, he's going to judge me. And folks, that's the judgment seat of Christ. For the believer, we're going to stand before the, one, the Lord one day and give an account at the Bema seat, the judgment seat. And so I can turn uh, my worrying about justice into praise because Bible prophecy tells me that in the future, the mystery of it, I'm going to stand before my Lord, and that's the one that's going to count. You can judge me all you want to, and people do. I'm going to be like, Paul. Oh, that's just a little thing. It's just a little thing. He says, I'm not even going to worry about that. He said, I can judge myself, and that's fine. But he said, the biggest thing is, is I'm going to stand before the Lord and be judged of him. So you're not my judge. I'm not even my judge. Jesus is my judge. And so I can praise God for that. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. All right, everybody with me? So God's judgment is where God judges us. Now, while you're there in 1 Corinthians 4, don't leave. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. All right? Therefore, that means because of what he just read to us, the fact, the truth of what he just read in verses 1 through 3, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest, reveal, make known the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have what? The praise of God. Are you with me? So the very first thing you do is you turn the prophecy into praise. We're learning what can prophecy do for us? What can we do with prophecy? Well, the first thing you need to do, turn it into praise. Amen? Can you do that? Can you start praising the Lord and giving God the praise? Amen. All right, secondly this morning, what, uh, you can turn prophecy into prayer. Hello? You can turn prophecy into prayer. Now, to understand prophecy is to cause you and I to pray. Prophecy leads us to intercession. You, see, you didn't know that. When you thought about prophecy, you didn't think about prophecy is going to turn, to turn it into prayer. It's going to cause you to pray and lead you to intercede and pray. Look at Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, think with me with that verse. What was John telling us in chapter 11 there in verse 15? What was he talking about? A what? He mentioned it twice. Become kingdoms. He's talking about a kingdom, right? And he's talking about the Lord's kingdom coming, right? All right, thinking with me? All right, what did we learn last week when we looked at the model prayer? What did Jesus tell us how to pray? When you pray, pray this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here we go. Thy kingdom come. John the Revelator says that one day his kingdom will come, and we call that the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, and we are, we are to what? We are to pray for that kingdom. Hello. Church, we're not in the kingdom now. 
Now, because of all that's going down here, we got these prophecy gurus out here that are so twisted up in their prophecy because they allegoric everything instead of taking the Scripture literally and so forth, and they feel that we're in, the, we're in the kingdom now, and that Christ is ruling and reigning on His throne in glory over us down here now, and that, uh, well, and, and this week I was reading another one, and he's already got us that we're the second horseman, the apocalypse of the horseman is now beginning to start. And he's claiming that these four horsemen are going to come before the rapture. Okay, this is what I'm saying, folks. You've you got to be careful who you listen to and what you're watching. But Jesus taught you and I how to pray. And prophecy, it can, I can turn Bible prophecy into prayer. And in Matthew 16, Jesus said, Pray, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Just think, you and I have the wonderful privilege to pray to have a, a part in the kingdom coming. By praying, thy kingdom come. That is wonderful. In Psalm 122, 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and they shall prosper that love thee. All right, what are we doing? We're praying for prophecy, right? Israel's not going to experience peace until the millennium. And the millennium is the kingdom. So, see, we have a great part in prophecy and in interceding in praying for it. And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Look what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36, verses 36 and 37. Then the heathen that are left round about, ye shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that there was, that was desolate. And I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. You know when that's going to take place? In the millennium. Hello? So again, we're to pray that God will continue and do what He says He will do for Israel. This all has to do with prophecy. Revelation 22, 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. John's praying here. Look at his prayer. Even so come Lord Jesus. We're to be praying for the coming of the Lord. Not living like there's no tomorrow. See, and you're not going to be doing that if you're focused horizontally rather than vertically. Don't let anything or anybody keep you from running your race. Don't you get focused on everything else. You focus on the coming of the Lord. So we're to pray for the kingdom to come. Amen. Isn't that what Jesus said? 2,000 years ago, he says, fellas, here's what I want you to do. I want you to reverence and respect and hallow God's name. I want you to pray in the Father's name. Address the Father. And here's what I want you to pray. You pray the kingdom come. Now, you remember in Matthew's Olivet Discourse, they went to him and said, Lord, wilt thou restore the kingdom at this time? And he said, no, the time is not for you to know. Matter of fact, even at the, in Acts when he ascended into glory, they asked again, would he restore the kingdom at this time? And he said, nope, you go to Jerusalem, you go there and wait till you get endued with power on high, and you're going to be witnesses under the Holy Ghost, and I'm out of here. And he took off and went to glory. So prophecy is wonderful that I can turn this prophecy that's coming into prayer. As I pray for the kingdom to come, just think we have a part in it. Now the kingdom's going to come whether you pray or not, okay? God's already got that laid out. But Jesus said pray for the kingdom to come. So we get a part in it. It's not going to be based on whether we pray or how well you work or look or anything else. God's already got it all planned out. But he's just telling us we need to pray for the kingdom. We need to pray for the peace of Israel. And if you do, you're going to be blessed. Hello? And then we need to pray for the Lord to come. John says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So how many of you been praying for that? How many of you have been praying for the kingdom to come? Amen. Folks, we're not living in the kingdom. Okay? You need to understand that. And we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They have no peace. And they will have no peace. And the Antichrist is on the scene already, I believe. He's already geared up, ready to go politically. He's ready to step right in and sign a peace covenant treaty with Israel. 
And when he does, Israel's going to think they've got peace. And that's going to last about three and a half years. But then it says what? When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a woman in travail. And that's the middle of the trib. Okay? And Israel won't know. And God will use that last half of that terrible part, terrible, terrible time of the tribulation to cause Israel to turn for their Messiah. And you know what's going to help them to do that? The two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. See? And they're going to be witnessing and telling Israel, you'd better get ready. Your Messiah is coming, which is the second coming of Christ. And so, it's fantastic. All right, so I can turn my prophecy into prayer. And so we looked at that last week about our prayer life, now we're doing. Look at Revelation 19.10. Oh, wait a minute, I missed one there, didn't I? Yeah, I got to get to page four here now, not five. Got my pages all messed up here. All right. Revelation 20, 22, 20. Oh, we already read that one, okay. We have a command to pray and ask God to do what God says he will do. And we have a part in the consummation of the age through prayer. It's fantastic. It's awesome. And so, wow, we have a part in prophecy. This is great. So I can turn my prophecy into prayer. Okay? Well, let's look at a third one we can do with our prophecy. We can turn our prophecy into purity. Into purity. Are you with me? Here we go. You can turn prophecy into purity. In 1 John 3, 2, the Bible says, Beloved, John writing to us, Now are we the sons of God. What are you? You are sons and daughters of God. When? Right now. You understand that? Now, now, folks, that ought to tell you something there, too. That ought to tell you how we ought to talk to each other and treat each other, because we are sons and daughters of God right now. We're His kids. We're not only the body of Christ, we're the bride of Christ. We're sons and daughters of God. Okay? Now, look what he says. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now, see, I, I don't know what we're going to be. I don't know if we're going to be fat, skinny, tall, short, blonde, redheads, whatever. I don't know what kind of clothes we're going to wear. And do you all know that? Scripture doesn't tell us. We don't know. Paul, John says we don't know what we're going to be. Okay, are you with me? But this we do know. We shall be, but we know that. Here's what we know. See, we don't know what we shall be. Okay, but we know, say that with me, we know. What do we know? That when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So how are we going to see Him? Well, we're going to see Him in a glorified body, so we know we're going to have a glorified body. And we're going to recognize Jesus. There's other scripture that tells us we're going to be known for what we were, and that we're going to know each other. But I still don't know anything else, because it doesn't tell us. But then Psalm 17, 15 says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Now we're talking about we're going to have and look like and we're going to have the, the righteousness of Christ in glory. That speaks of purity. See, prophecy tells me that sooner or later we're going to be pure and live in purity. This is fantastic. Now, look at the verse 3 of 1 John 3, 3. And every man that has this hope purifieth himself even as he is pure. What hope is that? That we're going to see him as he is and we're going to be like him. Now if we have that hope, prophecy then teaches me I can turn prophecy into purity. And we need to be living a pure life. Matter of fact, Peter says, be ye holy for I am holy. That speaks of purity. We're to be living a pure life. Prophecy tells me that so I can turn my prophecy into purity, knowing that that awaits me. So this is some of the reasons why we study the wonderful thing of prophecy. So we're learning about it because 25% of the Bible is prophecy. And so that's why we study it, because it's the infallible, inerrant Word of God. 
Amen? Now, there are those that think they're smarter than the Bible now and know more than God, and they believe they're the judge of the Bible. So they're, what they're telling me is that they don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, you see, because now they know more than Scripture and so forth. And Andy Stanley is one of them. Don't follow him. Okay? He's not even referring to even to the Bible as the Word of God and all this kind of stuff. You need to stay off of this, stay away from that guy. Turn to Colossians with me as we talk about this purity. Colossians chapter 3. Go over to Colossians chapter 3. You've got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. Okay? Colossians chapter 3. I don't like mentioning names sometimes, but sometimes I think you need to because people sometimes listen to the wrong people. And they can sound very convincing and, uh, and very persuasive. And they can do a lot of jargon and talking and never say anything. You ever heard people like that? Sit there and talk for an hour and you say, what did they say? They just talk in circles. When they talk fast and so intellectual, you haven't got a clue what they're saying anyway. But you should hear this guy. This is unbelievable. All right. Uh, so uh, everybody in Colossians chapter 3. Amen. All right. Let's begin reading Colossians chapter 3, beginning here in verse number 1. All right. If ye then be risen with Christ. Now, do you notice that if is always conditional? Because, see, not everybody's a believer. And not everybody's going to be risen with Christ. Hello? If you be risen with Christ, how many of you are risen with Christ today? Amen. All right, what are you to do? Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. Get your affection off the things on the planet. Start looking and focusing ver uh, 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 vertical, not horizontal. Okay? And not on the things on the earth. Not only things, but people. For ye are dead. Say, I'm dead. dead. Why is that? Because your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, therefore, verse 5, mortify, therefore, that means put to death, mortification of things of death, your members which are upon the earth, and he's listed some here, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, all right, and let me get closer. Ah, the bottoms are working. And covetousness, which is idolatry. So we see here, as we look at it, and notice in verse 6, For these things uh, sake the wrath of God, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. So we can turn our prophecy into purity today. So it's fantastic. All right, let's look at a fourth truth. We can turn prophecy into proclamation. We can turn our prophecy into proclamation. All right, everybody with me? Okay. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Are, are you getting this? In other words, what prophecy is all about? Real prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. Okay? Prophecy is not looking for something to happen. It is looking for someone to come. Quit looking for what's going to happen. We already know it's going to happen. The Bible's already told us that. 
We have the prophecy to tell us that. We have the word of God to tell us that. We have the, uh, the, the, you might say the affirmation, there we go, thank you, Lord, of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our spirit telling us that. So, hey, so that's why you see, folks, it's all about Jesus. This whole thing is about Jesus. It's not about you and I. It's all about Christ. And prophecy tells me, what can I do with it? I can turn prophecy into proclamation. The angel said, listen to the man, John, don't fall down and worship me. I'm one of your feathered brothers, brothers here, man. I've got the testimony of Christ just like you do. What's testimony? Testimony means to testify. Are you with me? 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Ah, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore, how many of you know something therefore? Here's what he's saying, knowing therefore, knowing what therefore, remember therefore is because of or what the truth or the fact that it was said. He said, knowing therefore that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day and give an account of whether or not we have testified. Are you with me? We persuade men, but we make manifest, we reveal, we make known unto God, and I trust also are made or manifest or revealed in your consciences. We want to persuade men that Jesus is coming, that there's a wrath to come, there's a judgment that's coming, and they can escape it. That's why we're here, church. We're here to testify to the fact that we need to warn people and tell everybody, hey, listen, man, Christ is coming. The rapture is about to take place. And after that, I want to tell you something. You don't want to be here because the wrath of God is going to be poured out on this planet. And you can't escape it. You can escape it by coming to Christ and going to rapture. If not, you're going to be left behind to go through the wrath of God. And hopefully by maybe some miracle, some chance, that you get saved. If not, then you've got nothing but hell to look forward to. You understand that? Do we really grasp a hold of that thought? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Who are you persuading? Have you been persuading anybody? Are you afraid to tell people that there's a judgment coming? Are you afraid to tell people there's the terror and the wrath of God coming? And you're always going to hear them come back and say, no, no, God's a loving God. And, oh, you know, no loving God would ever do that. No, that's nonsense. Yes, God is loving. Yes, he's all love. Yes, he's compassionate. Yes, he, he, he wants to save people. But God is also holy, and God is also righteous, and God is also going to bring about his judgment. And he's given you right now that claim all this a chance to be saved, to miss all of this. And, and if not, you're going to experience it and go through it. That's why Jesus said to go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges and compel them to come in. That word compel means to use force, if necessary, to grab them. Wouldn't you, if somebody was standing on the edge of a cliff and they were ready to fall off and fall to their death in a cliff or fall into a, a volcano down below? Or the earth earth's opened up and there's a, the, you know, I mean, and they're, they're ready to fall. Wouldn't you do everything you could do to grab them and snatch them and pull them back? Well, that's what it means to compel them to come in. And if people, I'm telling you, people are listening today. That's why we're going through this prophecy series. Because people are all in tune to what's going on right now. But the problem is, is so is a lot of other prophecy gurus out there. And they're pushing their tapes and their records and their everything else and books and everything. No, no, we're pushing Jesus. We're pushing Jesus and Jesus Christ and Him alone. And we're not pushing my books or my tapes or anything else. We're pushing the Word of God, the infallible and errant Word of God. And folks, whether you believe it or not, it's coming and it's going to happen because Bible prophecy tells me so. And we are to be out here proclamating and giving a proclamation trying to uh, convince people and share people that, uh, hey, listen, we, we, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's what we got to do. We need to bring people to Jesus Christ. Simple as that. 
if you believe all this. Now, you can do that through inviting them and encouraging them. That's why I kept announcing we were going to be doing this ahead of time. So you don't just say, oh, here we go, prophecy again. I've heard it all before. No, you're not. Because last week, a lot of people went out here and said, man, I learned a lot last week. And I heard stuff and uh, I'd never seen before. It opened my eyes. And the same thing's going to happen this morning. So this, this, is, this is awesome. And this is why we're trying to get people here and get people to tune in on this because there's a lot of false teaching going on out there right now. I mean, I'm watching them and looking them up and seeing what's being said and done so I know where I'm at so I don't come in here and make some dumb statement or, you know, or, or say something somebody said. Uh, <clears throat> you, Ted and I, we talked about it years ago. We thought, you know, maybe one of these days we finally get this thing all working right and he can be up there on the computer on a laptop and have it up on the screen and I'll already have it ahead of time for him where we want to go and then I can say, okay, Ted, hit it and he hits it and up pops, uh, you know, Billy James Joe and, and you listen to exactly what he says and then you listen to what the Word of God says and you can say, whoa, there's a big discrepancy here and a difference and then I can say, now see folks, I wasn't just spouting off at the mouth and, and telling you something. You heard it right from the horse's mouth. And that's going on right now, heavily. And so with all that going on and what's happening, I said, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? Where, where do we want to go with this? He said, well, it's time to get back into some prophecy. You hadn't been in it for a while. And uh, I'm going to show you some new things for you and bring some new revelation to your heart and mind uh, from what you've done before. And it's going to be exciting for you. And hopefully you'll deliver it to them and it'll be exciting for them so that you can get it exciting for others and get your, 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 get your appetite wet. You know, and get you motivated and, 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 and tuned up and realize, man, we're, we're there. And you're going to see uh, again this morning. I can't wait to get into it. Sunday school's over. So let's finish. First Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. And we're done. For what is our hope? You have hope today? What's your hope today? What is your hope or what is your joy or what is your crown rejo of rejoicing? are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when? At His coming. For ye are our glory and joy. This is what Paul's talking to the Thessalonican believers because they thought they were going to miss it. So he's trying to get them straightened out. There's a rapture coming. We're going to meet the Lord. We're going to be in His glory. And, and Paul says, because you believers now, you're our glory, glory and our joy because you've come to Christ. You have this blessed hope now that Jesus is coming. The rapture is going to take place. You're saved. And he said, man, that brings joy and glory to us. It's fantastic. Why? Because he was proclamating the gospel. He was telling them all about this. And it's fantastic. So, what profit is there in prophecy? Well, you can turn your prophecy into praise. You can turn it into prayer. You can turn it into proclamation, right? What are some of the others? There were five, right? Purity. Yep, you can turn your prophecy into purity. What's another one? Help me, Bonnie. What? What? Proclamation, there were four of them, right? Yeah. All right, there you go. What were they? Turn your prophecy into what? Praise. Praise. Turn it into prayer. Turn it into purity. And turn it into proclamation. That's what you can do with Bible prophecy. So, and see what, folks, if you do that, that'll get you focused on the right things. And you won't have to worry about how many angels can sit on the head of a pen You don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about all what, what's going to happen and go on. What we need to do is praise God. We need to pray. We need to live a pure life. And we need to proclamate, proclamate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're to do. And that's what prophecy tells us to do. Praise God. Father, thank you for today. We love you. We praise you. Hope that we take this and apply it to our lives more than ever before. Be a blessing. Be a help. Be an encouragement and be a proclamator of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of what's coming. And that they can miss it all by coming to a relationship with a personal faith and trust and relationship with Jesus Christ. So we thank you and we praise you now, Lord. Go with us into our service now. Father, again, we ask for your wisdom, illumination, and certainly to bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said. And Lord, help us to explain it and to make it good help us lord i need your help In jesus name amen